in light of current difficulties that the believers of James' day were facing, and in light of the promised coming of the Lord, he writes these words, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no, no, lest you fall into judgment. Father, I want to ask you to help us now to understand these words. We realize that this is your communication to us, and it's important, it's valid, it's valuable. So may we find encouragement and instruction and insight as we pursue this journey of living by faith and trusting in you from these words. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. If you had to search your memory, search your mind and your heart, and try to identify for you, for yourself, what would be the greatest day of your life to date, what would that day be? If you had to go all the way back through all of your mind, and some of you might say, well, it was, it was the day I got saved, or maybe the day I got married, or the day my children were born. But I want to tell you about another great day that can happen for you today. If you're here this morning and you're one of those kinds of people who seems to always be burdened down by the weight of living, who just seems to drag through life, I want to tell you the greatest, one of the greatest days that can happen in your life, one of the most liberating days that can happen in a believer's life is when we learn to just trust the Lord. To just come to a place where we say, Lord, my life is yours, and I believe in you. I believe you're interested in my life. I believe you're involved in my life, and so I'm going to trust you with my life. Whatever's going on in my life, Lord, I'm just going to entrust it to you. I want to tell you, that can be a liberating day for you. And many of you are sitting here with a kind of a confused look on your face thinking, I wonder what that would look like. For me to just be able to come to a place where I could say, I'm taking my hands off of my life and just giving it to the Lord because we're not too good at that, are we? We're, we're a lot better at trying to manage and to manipulate and to manufacture ways to get our lives in better condition than they might currently be in. Truth is, as we move along this journey of life, we have all kinds of experiences. There are stops and there are starts. There are fast lanes. There are pileups. There are detours and there are ditches. And as believers, we tend to face our own particular set of problems and pressures that are unique to us because of our faith, because of what we believe. And sometimes our problems and our circumstances or maybe like small potholes along the way. They just shake us up or jar us a little bit. Or sometimes they may be like huge boulders that are blocking our path. But let me tell you this, and mark this down in your mind and in your memory. The obstacles that you and I face because of our faith are mostly minimal compared to those to whom James is writing. And compared to many others in other places in the world, that for them to embrace faith in Jesus Christ, and certainly for them to testify to that faith, may put their very lives in peril. So, so please understand, as James starts dealing with the problems of, of persecution or the challenges of Christianity, that, that our lives, we understand that on an entirely different scale than the people that first received this letter more than likely. 
And, and we understand this on a much different scale than a lot of people who, who live in very dangerous places where to name the name of Christ is, is a death offense. And so we understand that. But we also know that, that God is willing to come to us and help us and strengthen us in whatever we face, just like He is the people that James wrote to or the people that are in different parts of the world that struggle and face very trying circumstances. And so James brings these words of encouragement and these words of instruction regarding standing firm in the face of harsh or abusive treatment or difficult circumstances or challenges that are maybe beyond what we can bear in our own strength. So the question of the day that is brought up by this passage of Scripture is very simple. How can believers remain faithful in the face of difficult opposition? How do we remain faithful? James gives us some information and insight about that. And it essentially tells us in these verses that in order to remain faithful, it requires what I would call spiritual stamina. Stamina. The ability to, to maintain, to keep on going, to develop a strength that is stronger than the circumstances that we face, to develop an energy that continues even when the circumstances of life are beating us down or challenging us or trying to drain us of all the energy that we have. So whenever James begins to talk to believers in his day, he begins to talk to them about this spiritual stamina, or maybe even we may even call it spiritual toughness, where, where we are able to, to stand strong in the face of anything that might come against us and try to knock us down. So I want to talk to you this morning about, first of all, two aspects of spiritual toughness. In spiritual toughness, if you're going to experience it, perseverance is a must. Now, he uses the word here, patience. And we need to understand that word patience. It's really a two-dimensional word. It basically means the ability to wait. How many of you are good at that? I, I can promise you this. And, and I thought about doing this just to see what would happen. I, I thought about just saying, okay, let's just stop right here, right now, for two minutes and just be still and quiet. And I promise you, before that two minutes would be over, there would be people fidgeting and squirming and saying, oh, boy, that's, this has got to be longer than two minutes. This is, what is this? You'd be, you'd be beside yourself if you just had to sit still right here in quietness for two minutes because we're not all that good at waiting. I, I remember many, many years ago, uh, our friend uh, Ray Riding saying, when he asked for patience, he said, Lord, I want patience and I want you to give it to me now. And that's kind of how we are about that. Kim and I made a little trip the other day to one of her happy places. I just can't understand this. It's a place called Canton, Texas. <laughs> and and we, were, we, were going, we were going to continue the trip on down to, to my home territory. And so I, I had to stop there with her. And so we, we were there for two or three hours. And uh, at the last part, she was there and I was in the truck. And, and, and she comes out and she says, thank you so much for being patient with me about this. And you know what I said? I said, I really didn't have much choice because I'm preaching on patience on Sunday. <laughs> and she said, you know what she said? She said, that's going to be an illustration, isn't it? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's going to kind of try to drive home the point. So we think about patience and we talk about patience and we have our perspective about patience. But when we come to patience in our faith, it really does kind of have a different meaning sometimes. It's more than just to wait, but it's to wait in strength. It's to wait not, not with frustration, not with edginess, not, not, with, not being antsy or, or incomplete. It's to wait in strength. And so it has the idea, the second dimension is endurance, to be able to bear up under the circumstances or the situations and to continue faithfully uh, carrying out the responsibilities and living in the fullness of what God has provided, even when the circumstances are harsh or difficult or draining. So the idea of, of patience in this passage is that we persist in the face of problems or perils or even persecutions, and that we do so with an absolute unshakable faith in this God that we've come to follow, that we've come to believe in, that we've come to trust. We have faith in Him. We have confidence in Him. And it is absolutely unshakable. And that sometimes is a tall order for us. But that's what James encourages us to strive toward. That's what James encourages us to live within. 
This faith, it's unshakable regardless of what the circumstance of the situation looks like. So what does it all mean? What is this idea of perseverance about? So perseverance is needed, and thankfully for us, in James, perseverance is then illustrated. And he uses three different illustrations, and we want to kind of pick those apart a little bit and see what they're talking about. He begins by talking about the patience of a farmer. He says, give attention to the patient farmer. Now what he's doing here is he's probably not thinking so much about the farmer who has a million acres and, 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 and farms it with these huge gigantic tractors that will cut up about half an acre per, per row, per turn. He's talking about the Palestinian peasant. He's talking about the person that, that has to work with very little in terms of resources or tools or opportunities. And so he wants us for these moments to ponder the life of the Palestinian peasant farmer who is maybe out in the middle of nowhere trying to raise some kind of a crop to feed his family or to feed what scant amount of livestock he might have. And so he tells us about this, this farmer, and here's what he says. Be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, in that moment, he identifies something that we need to pay a little bit of attention to. He talks about waiting for the precious fruit. So he says on the other end of our ability to, to develop this patience, there is something precious for those who are able to endure, for those who are able to persevere, for those who are able to maintain and to keep on keeping on. So we're moving towards something precious. Keep that in your mind. So he says life for this farmer, even though he knows he's waiting for something that is a treasure, something that is of great value, something that means something and matters to him, he says that he does so with a lot of uncertainty. His life is marked by various uncertainties that are even so filled with an element of expectation. He is dependent, absolutely dependent on the forces of nature. Look at what he says. He waits for the precious fruit of the earth. So the first thing he's dependent on as a farmer is the earth. If you've ever tried to plant anything or grow anything or raise anything as a crop, you know that the type of soil, the, the earth in which you planted, the preparation of that earth, the, 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 the tending to that earth and making it ready is a very important part. And, and the earth itself is, is a very important element in determining what you can grow or what will grow or what you're going to end up with. And so he says he's dependent upon the earth itself, the soil. He's also dependent on the early and latter rains. He says, he says that these things are things that are absolutely beyond his control. So the idea here, the picture here is that as we move along through this, this life of faith, this journey of living for the Lord... He says what's going to happen is you're going to find yourself facing things that are circumstances of, over which you have no control. You're going to find yourself dealing with things that you can't change, that you can't alter, that you can't manage, things that are beyond yourself. And so he says you need to understand that in order to endure, sometimes you're going to come up against something that you can't do anything about. There's your encouraging word this morning. There's some things in your life that you can't affect one way or another. You can't change them. You can't alter them. They are what they are. You're dependent on these circumstances. Your life and the shape of it becomes determined by things beyond your control. But he also says that in spite of that, for this farmer, that his life is also marked with diligence. Even though he doesn't know if the rains are going to come, when they're going to come, if the earth is going to produce and yield forth the fruit of the seed that he sows, he continues diligently to do what he knows he needs to do on his part to make sure that everything turns out the very best way that it possibly can. So with diligence and then investment, he moves forward. He presses on, even though he is doing so with a certain amount of risk involved. Now I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you live your life with a willingness to take the risk of faith. The risk of faith. We like things to be where we are able to know the answers before the fact. How many times have we ever just given God that blank check of our lives, just signed it away and said, Lord, I don't know what you want to do with my life. 
I don't know what you want my life to look like. I don't know what shape it needs to take. I don't know how you want to use me. I don't know how I need to be involved in things eternal, your kingdom. But I'm willing to take the risk and to say to you, here's my life as it is, and whatever you do with it and wherever you take it, whatever you choose to make of it, I'm willing for you to do that. How many of us have just taken our hands off and said, Lord, I am going to trust you, period. My life is not my own. Well, he knows. He gives us the example of the farmer who invests with diligence and, and knows that there's a risk that what he's doing may not turn out the way he wants it to or expects it to, but he is dependent on circumstances beyond his control. I'm going to tell you something. The best thing that you can do in your life is to make it dependent on God by entrusting it to Him because it may be beyond your control, but you'll never find any situation in your life that is beyond His control. And so we entrust our life to Him. In the same way, he says, as the patient farmer moves forward with investment and risk, he says, establish yourselves. Establish your hearts. So he talks about the patient farmer. Then he talks about the persistent prophets. Look at what he says in verse number 10. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. He says the prophets were a poster boy for how to face and endure affliction. You think about those prophets of old. And here he emphasizes the, the, the nature of suffering in, in the face of the call of God upon their lives. And he says that they were like a rock that is placed by the sea, and the sea pounds it and pounds it and pounds it every day, but that rock just stays strong. He says that's the way the prophets were. Their patience was marked by an active living, active godly living in the face of terrible tribulation. Let's find an example. Let's think about Jeremiah, the prophet of old. He's probably a, one of the most classic examples of a man who answered the call of God with a blank check of his life, said, here I am, Lord, do with me what you need to do, what you want to do, and suffered terrible, terrible persecution in the process. He's an arresting example for us of persistent patience in the face of terrible tribulation. Jeremiah was called as a teenager. Whenever he was a, a young boy growing up, he was called by God to bring messages of judgment, of, of God's determination to correct to chastise the people. This young boy was sent into, into the, 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 the nation to preach the, the Word of God. He was called as a teenager, and he was living in a tiny village. And his first message was to call the people to radical repentance. And, and he, was, he was so radical in his messaging that his own family initially tried to kill him. He began to preach the Word of God, and his family tried to kill him. He stood in the face of that. Then he went to the gate of the temple on a great feast day, and he told the assembly there that their worship was worthless because they had no intention of pleasing God. That they could bring all the animal sacrifices they wanted to, and they could kill them until the blood ran in the streets, but that their, that their hearts were not in it, their hearts were not right with God, and so no matter what they did, they would not be pleasing to God. The religious establishment then decided they wanted to kill him. And so they set about to do that. They actually beat him and stretched his limbs painfully in stocks and tried to pull him apart. And he was preserved in the midst of that difficulty and that persecution. And he preached his entire life without a single person ever coming to the place where they said, we hear your message, we affirm it, and we believe it. No converts whatsoever. And he ended up suffering great depression. He ended up blaming God. And at the end of his life... He was actually taken to Egypt by some Jewish refugees. But you know what? In the face of all of that, he kept doing what God called him to do. He kept living the message that God called him to embody and to preach. His obedient living stretched him. But I'll tell you this, he endured. And so James says, you look at the prophets. He's one example among many. You can look at Elijah. You can look at Elisha. You can look at Isaiah. You can look at Ezekiel. You can look at any of those guys you want to, and you'll see that they had the, the toughest calling upon their lives that a person could hope to have. Hebrews says, consider Jesus, the captain of our faith, 
who for the joy that was set before him endured the suffering and despised the shame. Consider Jesus, prophet and priest and king. And so he says, you, be, you, you consider these prophets and you let them be an example to you of what patience ought to look like, what endurance needs to be shaped like. The third thing he mentions is the patriarch Job as an example for us. We had the opportunity a few months back to study in our Sunday school class, I mean verse by verse from chapter 1 to chapter end, the life of Job. We saw that that man put up with so much. Whereas Jeremiah was attacked by people, Job was attacked by circumstances and by people. Things that he couldn't control came in upon his life. He had no way of understanding why they were there. He lived his life and never knew why the things that happened to him happened to him. But he learned in the process of all of that to, to give everything over into the hands of God. And he maintained his faith. Even whenever his friends told him that he was the vilest of sinners because of the suffering and the sorrow that befell him. Even whenever he couldn't Come, with, come up with answers for himself. Even whenever God said, Job, who are you to question me? He still maintained his faith. And in the end, after he endured, he was blessed, greater than he was at the first. Now, as James is speaking to these people of his day, not, not, not a, a farmer necessarily, some of them may have been, not a prophet per se, though there may have been a prophet being raised up in that group, and certainly not Job. He's saying to them, like these people endured, like these people persevered in their faith, that's what I want you to become. That's what I want your life to look like. And, and so by virtue of that application, that's what God's Word tells us that He wants our lives to look like. And so you say, boy, that's a, that's a tough thing. It's a tough thing to be called to embrace this kind of challenge. What's, what's the motivation? What's the prize at the end of this race? That's where he talks about the coming of the Lord. He says early on in verse number 7, he talks about, You be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Verse number 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. And so he says, in light of whatever circumstance you face, you have to live that with an understanding that God is going to interject himself through his son, Jesus Christ, and come into the situation at some point in time. Now, <laughs> we went to East Texas. I'm talking about the real East Texas. You know, if you, if you were to, to draw a circle around East Texas that, that encompassed really the whole of, uh, of Redneck Arena, and, and you were to put a pin right in the middle of it, that's where we were, okay? That's where we were this past weekend. And so we went down there to see some family and some friends from a long time ago. And we were going out to out by Sam Rayburn Lake, and, and if you go out the highway and turn back on the farm road that takes you down to, to the lake where we were, there's a little church there. It's called Concord Baptist Church. And as many churches do, they have one of these signs that they put these messages on. This one had a message on it, and it caught my eye, and I thought, that's, that's a pretty interesting message. I want to, are you ready for some sheer poetry this morning? You ready for this? Eternity is long, and hell is hot. Jesus is coming, ready or not. <laughs> I thought, that's, that's, that's pretty classic, I guess. You know, Milton probably wouldn't include that in any of his stuff or Longfellow or Robert Frost or any of them, but, you know, it's still kind of poetic. It's very blunt. You've got to admit that. But I'm telling you this, the message, as, as abrupt as it may be, it's still a message we need to pay attention to. Jesus is coming. He is coming. Now, I want to tell you two, two things that that means to us. It may be that for us, in the current circumstance of our lives, it may be that for us in the challenges that we face, Jesus comes to us in intervention. He comes to us to bring to us relief. He comes to us to bring to us strength and help. He comes to us to bring hope or to bring the opportunity and the ability to endure and to persist. He comes in intervention. 
How many times have you found yourself facing things, dealing with things that are beyond the scope of your strength, and you bow your head and your knees and your heart in prayer before God, and you sense that God comes to you, that He comes to you, and He's there for you, and He's with you, and He's strengthening you, and He's helping you, and He's lifting you up, and where once you were downhearted or oppressed or weak, suddenly you have this surge within you, and it is Christ coming into that situation to enter intervene and to help to bring you hope. If you've had that happen, just say amen. Praise God for that because all of us have. So sometimes he comes to us in intervention and we rejoice in that. We rejoice for those who face difficulty and challenge because they're in a place in the world where difficulty is beyond our wildest imagination and to share the gospel openly would cost them maybe their lives or their freedom and and they, they are so downhearted and so oppressed and so beaten down and they get on their faces and they pray or people here pray for them and suddenly they begin to see a victory and Christ has come alongside them and they begin to rejoice that Jesus has lifted them up. He's the lifter of our heads after all. And so He lifts them up and we praise Him when He comes to us in intervention. But there's also a sense in which the coming of the Lord talks about His coming at what is called the consummation of the age, the conclusion of all things. Whenever the end of time as we know it will take place. And so Jesus will come at a point in time. Scripture says to us that the Lord will come with a shout of the archangel. The trumpet call will blast when the angel stands in the sun And the Lord, under the the leadership and the authority of God the Father, is told that all things are now ready, and the heavens break open, and this Lord who ascended into the sky will in like manner come in the same way that He left. He'll come again, and He's going to come. And when He comes this time, it won't be to intervene in our problems so that at some point in the future we'll have something else that we need as an intervention in. When He comes the next time, It'll be to do away with all the suffering, with all the persecution, with all the challenges, with all the difficulty, with all the pain, with all the sorrow, with all the heartache, with all the brokenness, with all the sin. He's going to do away with all that. And so James says, in light of that reality, you endure. In light of that reality, you persevere. You continue. You keep on keeping on. You press on. Dig down inside yourself and keep on going because His promise is true. So, He says, in light of all of these things, you be patient. But then He says something else that I think we need to pay a little bit of attention to because not only is there a determination that we've got to reach down inside of ourselves and give to this process, but there's also a demeanor that needs to come into play. We don't, we don't do this as people that are, that are angry or, or people that are op- depressed or people who are beaten down. He says, while you're doing this, there's a certain spiritual sensitivity that needs to be present in your life as well. Look at what he says here. He says two or three things that are very important. Look in verse 9. As he says, you live in light of the coming of the Lord. He says, do not grumble against one another. Where does that come from? He says, whenever things get tough, whenever, whenever you begin to have this sense of being beaten down or oppressed or challenged, the tendency is for us to, to lose our joy, for us to get aggravated at what's going on in our lives. And so he says, don't, don't be that way. Don't come to a place where because things are a little bit tough for you, that you're, you're a person that, that becomes hard and difficult to live with, and everybody elbowed their neighbor. Because you know it's talking about them and not you, right? He says, don't grumble against one another. Well, I kind of turn that into a positive, and here's my thought. He's telling us to be compassionate with each other, to, to care about each other, to not treat each other badly because circumstances around us have gotten a hold of our lives and they're not what we would have wanted them to be or they're more difficult than we can handle in our own strength. Be compassionate. Don't grumble against each other. Build each other up. Encourage each other. The second thing in verse 12 is he tells us to be consistent. 
He says, above all, my brethren, do not swear by heaven or earth or by any other oath. He says, don't, have to, don't, don't live your life in such a way that you have to verify everything that comes out of your mouth by swearing, oh, I, I swear this is true. You know, if, if somebody says that all the time, the chances are that some of the things they're saying may not be true. Because they're having to verify. And val- this, 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 I'm, I'm telling you the truth this, this time. You ever had anybody say that to you? I tell you? I'm telling you the truth this time. Well, what that means is they haven't been all the time. And so he says, don't live your life in such a way where you have to swear to validate what you're saying. Be consistent all the time. Live with integrity. Live with truthfulness. And then I added one thing. Be compassionate, be consistent, and be expectant. Don't ever let the enemy convince you that Christ won't come. Don't let the enemy tell you that Christ will not come to your life in intervention to bring His strength and to add His strength to your strength. Don't don't let the enemy tell you that He will not come to encourage you when the darkness closes in. What does the song say? When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest in His unchanging grace. Through every dark and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Be expectant. You believe whenever things are tough that Jesus is not going to leave you or forsake you, that if there's a storm in your life, that He will come to you on that storm and that He'll take you through the rest of that storm. Because that's who he is. That's what he does. So you be expectant that he'll come in intervention. You be expectant that he's going to come one day at the consummation, the completion of all things. And you know what? Whenever that happens, if your heart is right, if you've been saved, if you've given your life to Christ, if you're you're trusting in him, then he's going to bring you home with him. And all the things that you're facing now, they will seem like they were just a blink if you even remember them at all. Because that's who He is. And that's the promise of His Word. So, be patient. Be persistent. Endure. Be determined. Let Christ build you up. And don't let let the circumstances of the enemy tear you down. This morning, I want to tell you something that is, is, is... plainly as I know how to say it, I want you to know that if you're in this room and and you have a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, that there is no circumstance, there is no situation that you can face that phases Him. There's nothing that makes God blank. You, You can't find anything that's big to God. Everything about your life, it may seem overwhelming to you, but it's not to Him. And He is on His throne today, and He will help you. He'll help you. And the most liberating thing you can do is to put your life in all of its parts in His hand and to say, you know what, God? This is the day that I'm not going to worry about these things anymore. I'm just going to trust You. Oh, I'm going to pray and ask You to to, to help me and to teach me and to lead me and to move me from this or remove this from me, but I'm going to trust You with it, whatever it is. But if you're here this morning and you are not a believer, you've not confessed Christ as your Savior, you've not given your heart to Him, you've not believed and trusted, then I want you to know that today He's ready to receive you. He's ready to become your Lord and your Savior and and, and to bring His strength and His grace and His mercy in far surpassing measure into your life, your circumstance, and to help you. But you have to come to Him in faith believing that He is and that He will do what He says He'll do. So this morning I want to encourage you, if that's where you are, to to trust Him with your heart today. Give your life to Him. Watch what He does with it. It'll blow your mind. Father, I want to thank you this morning for James' words to us. How encouraging they are to me just to think about uh, Him writing to people that are facing things that I can't even, even think about in my mind. Things more horrendous, things more more devastating and more dangerous than anything I've ever seen or done. And yet he says to them, just keep on. You wait with strength. You wait with patience and endure. Help me to be that way, Father. For those who don't know Jesus today, or who are struggling in some area or another of their lives, I pray that they will bring that to you and trust their life to you today. In Jesus' name.